welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the one-stop shop for actors and creators both above and below the line. I am your host, Vinny Mancuso, Backstage Senior Editor and Professional Entertainment Obsessive. I'll be your guide through every corner of the creative industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. Here you'll find intimate, in-depth talks with today's most award-worthy names in film, television, and theater. Along the way, we'll get advice on living your best creative life, relatable stories of the highest highs and lowest lows, and maybe, just maybe, a rare peak in the envelope. Don't want a career like someone else's want your career. That's going to be even more fulfilling. My career, I don't know how I created my career. I never thought about being on Broadway. I never thought about a television show or being these films that I am or these people. I wanted to work and do good work. And one thing led to another and to another. And that's, that's the truth of this career. You've got to be committed for the long run of it. Your success is not going to look like someone else's success. And that's the truth. Hello, my friends. Welcome to yet another episode of In the Envelope, the Actors Podcast. I am your host, Vinny Mancuso, and today's episode is a treat. They're all treats. Who am I kidding? How could they not be? During my short but extremely memorable time hosting this podcast, uh, we've had professional wrestlers, 90s icons, MCU heroes, deaf Oscar-winning history makers... There is no two episodes of In the Envelope that are alike. I love that. But today, we bring you one of my favorite versions of this show, an absolute masterclass. We are joined today by Coleman Domingo, playwright, director, actor, photographer, trombone player, star of TV series like Euphoria, Fear the Walking Dead, scene stealer in movies like Zola and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and If Beale Street Could Talk, Coleman is just that rare multi, 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 multi hyphenate, and getting a chance to talk craft and acting and stage and screen, everything with him, it's just, it feels like getting a chance to sit beneath the learning tree, if the learning tree also had the most podcast-friendly voice of all time. It's a wonderful conversation. I cannot wait for you to hear it. Let's just get right into it. Here is Coleman Domingo. For your Emmy consideration for Outstanding Limited Series and all other categories, the HBO Max original limited series, The Staircase, inspired by a true story, explores the life of Michael Peterson, his sprawling North Carolina family, and the suspicious death of his wife, Kathleen Peterson, starring Colin Firth and Tony Collette. All episodes now streaming on HBO Max. Coleman Domingo is a master craftsman moving seamlessly between movies, TV, and theater. After years racking up critical acclaim and a Tony nomination, on stage both on and off Broadway, he enjoyed his on-screen breakout with AMC's Fear the Walking Dead, a leap to television to go along with a remarkable run of film performances in movies like Lincoln, If Beale Street Could Talk, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and Zola. These days, Domingo is once again building Emmy's buzz with his appearance in Euphoria Season 2, where he reprises the role of Ali, a former addict and sponsor to Zendaya's Rue. Here is the great Coleman Domingo. Go. <laughs> yeah, and go. How are you doing today, sir? How's it going? Doing very well, my friend. Very well. Amazing. Thank you so much for uh, not only for doing this, but I think uh, we booked this yesterday. <laughs> I think yeah. uh, so. I, I I cannot appreciate. I cannot say thank you enough for for being here. Um, I'm so excited to talk to you because I, I it's a joy to do this with with anybody, but someone who is so dedicated to craft, uh, who who sort of exudes such a enthusiasm for craft. It's just it, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. That it's if there's anything. I love to talk about is the craft of what we do and how we how we do it. Amazing. So I'm going to back it all the way up. 
you were born and raised in Philadelphia. And you're currently, these days, writing, directing, producing a series, uh, West Philly Baby. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious when you sort of take stock of everything, uh, everything that's happened in between being born in Philly, working on a show based on living in Philly, um, how has your artistic journey sort of shaped by where you came from? I think in every single way. I think if anyone knows anything about Philadelphians, people from Philadelphia, they are usually the underdog. You know, we're the next city from, from New York. Usually people are not sort of like checking for us, mm -hmm. which helps us um, thrive, I think. I think anyone I know from Philadelphia, that's also part of their charm. I think people from Philadelphia are, are the salt of the earth. What you see is what you get. I don't think people know how to put on airs in Philadelphia because it's predominantly a very blue collar city. And I think that I'm, I'm very proud of my roots and where I come from. I come from very humble people in many ways, very working class people who um, I, I think instilled great values in me of a really tremendous work ethic that the only thing, your success will be based on how hard you work and how much you uh, dedicate yourself to something, whatever that is. And also education, was very important. Um, and also, to be very honest, I think being a good citizen, I know that's very, my mother and father were very concerned about that. Like, what are we doing in the world? What kind of person were we being? Uh, how are we with our neighbors? Um, I was the kid in my neighborhood who went to the store for every sort of elderly lady, and it paid me, you know, 50 cents or a dollar. And then I had jobs, you know, I was a hustler. I, I love to make money because I knew if I wanted something, I had to buy it. You know, my, my parents didn't have the luxury of like giving us, you know, any, you know, thing that we wanted, clothing or a toy or something like that. We could, we had to earn it. Uh, you know, not that like, and, and not in any way, shape or form. I felt like I grew up a very wealthy kid in many ways. Like I never really wanted for anything. I, I didn't know that we were, you know, barely making ends meet. Um, I knew every so often when I would see my mom sitting at the dining room table, kind of worried and put the stacks of bills out. And she had two jobs and my dad had, um, a full-time job and, and they have four kids. And, you know, but I, I do know that they, they made sure that I, I worked hard and that will be the key to my success. So I think Philadelphia, I owe Philadelphia everything. And I, I love to create stories as a, as a writer and as a director and a producer that are based in Philadelphia. Most of my plays, people are either coming to Philadelphia or leaving Philadelphia. There's Philadelphia in there somewhere. And even my musicals in some way. And I think I understand why, because I'm fascinated with the people of mm -hmm. Philadelphia. That they're very interesting characters. People are large in their own experience. They're sort of living in their own operas. And so I love it. I, I think it's all of it's so much of who I am. It's interesting, you know, because you, you mentioned when you come from a place of characters, you sort of want to put those characters into your art. Uh, I'm curious when you sort of took stock of the fact of the idea that you're of ob observing people, observing the people around you and using that in your art. You know, I've always done that, I guess. Um, my, when I first, when I wrote my first, my first and only solo show called A Boy and a Soul, my family was very bewildered at how much I could retain and remember from my childhood, like in detail, stories, colors, smells. But I was the, I was the third kid for the longest. I'm what you call the knee baby. That means my mother had my my little brother when I was still a baby. Like, you know, well, I was what, nine years old. So I was the youngest. Then she had my, my little brother, Philip. So with that, I think that, you know, the family, how can I say it? I, I want to get this just tr tremendously correct. I think that I grew up in such a way that I was a very shy kid when it comes to my elder siblings who are all really funny, they have great personalities, they were sporty, all that stuff. And I was the nerd and I watched everything. Um, I also had a speech impediment, which um, sort of catered to me being shy, which as I think about it, to be very honest, was I shy? I don't know if I was shy. I just didn't like to speak because I didn't want to be teased. And then I almost didn't want to be seen because I was wearing my brother and sister's hand-me-down clothing. So I think I was almost like a, a shy kid by design. <laughs> there is no other choice. There is no, there is no other, other choice. choice. But yeah, yeah. I don't want to get beat up. So, you know, but eventually I think that, you know, I, I just sort of came out of my shell by the time I got to college. You know, I think I, my mother was always saying, hey, you should, you know, take a class or do something that we feel like, you know, you're so, 
you're so interesting and funny at home, but you don't let anyone else see that, you know, out, outside or anything. So when I got to college, that's when I took my first acting class. It's so interesting because, you know, I, I doing these, you know, talking to actors over the years and, and doing these interviews, I'm always fascinated by what the constant is. And so many actors describe themselves as shy, which kind of <laughs> runs counter counterintuitive to anyone who doesn't really isn't in the industry. They look at it as you're, you're a performer. You go out, you're putting yourself out there. And I'm, I'm curious, as you're sort of looking at this, what, why, why do you think that that's such a constant that people who are working actors would probably describe themselves as either shy or private or introverted? Well, I don't know. I wonder because I feel, I feel like people have asked me for years, like, you know, how did you come into acting? I'm like, I think acting sort of chose me. I, I wanted to be a storyteller. I wanted to be to write more than anything. I, I wanted this very sort of like be in dark rooms and writing stories, but it made sense to articulate these stories and sort of you put on the clothes of someone else, and but it still calls on all those skills that you love of research and uh, interrogation. So I, I wonder, I, I think um, I think that we're able to, because we watch people a lot. The shy people are the ones who are, they have a lot going on actually. How they say, you know, um, still waters run deep. I do believe that because I knew that once, once I started performing, all that stuff that I've been thinking about, that I've been watching, learning, hearing, was all inside of me. And then it just took uh, the craft of acting and also the respect for it to uh, learn how to access that stuff. I had so much. And um, I think that that's what's, what has been such a great um, source for my career, of being curious, to be very honest. Well, that's, that's interesting because I... I, I, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, you also went to school for photojournalism, uh, yeah. not, not acting, and and that is you know that is the, in its essence, the observance of other people. That is you know that's documenting other people. I'm curious how much of that early desire to be a photojournalist do you think kind of bled into your to your career as an actor and a, and a writer? It did. Well, you know, I was that nerd. I mean, you look at my high school photos, and it's me in a baggy sweater and glasses, and the you know, on the school newspaper. And everything that anyone had wrote in my yearbook was like, oh, I'm such a quiet, sweet, quiet, sweet guy. And I think that, um, I don't know, I think I went on this journey to really, uh, I don't know, move the needle in, in my own life to just, um, I don't know, just pour all of that. I feel like I, I love thinking about what makes us work and tick and operate. And I think that I wanted to go to war-torn countries and document what was happening in the world. That's what I really wanted to do. And then my photography became um, a hobby for a while. I started to take headshots because I was an actor. I knew that actors could use a cheap headshot. And then I did portraiture as well. So it was, I was still doing the same thing, I realized. I was still like looking into people's eyes and talking to them and finding out what their story was and seeing how I can capture it in a shot. And for a long time, I started to take headshots. That was always my side hustle between bartending and doing headshots for my side hustle. I was just very curious about other people. And I think that it is that someone told me that, rec um, not recently, but a while ago. So, well, Coleman, what you are, I would like to say that you're an archivist. And I, because she said, you started out wanting to be a former journalist and you're an actor, director, writer. You're kind of doing the same thing. And I said, wow, oh, I never thought about that. He said, you're, you're an archivist. You're trying to document what's happening in the world that you live in right now. And so you're just finding different mediums to do that. And um, for a long time, I'd even put down on my profiles and all, Coleman Domingo Archivist. I love that. <laughs> because I think that for me as well, it sort of keeps me out of, um, I don't, out of these boxes because I do everything. I don't do everything, but I do a lot of things. Pretty on close. No, <laughs> on many platforms, you know what I mean? Because, you know, I, I enjoy it. I, so I think that, that that helps describing what I do because it's it's hopefully it's bigger than just being an actor or director. Not saying that those are small, but I think that my my curiosity is bigger and deeper, I guess. So would you say that, you know, in terms of character building, is is that sort of the, the foundation of it? Is it sort of a is it where you're trying to take that that study of people to a person who doesn't exist, a person who, a person who isn't actually, you know, he's on the page, but isn't, isn't real. Well, with every, every role that I do as an actor, I think that there's something that 
clicks inside of me that I'm curious about. Most of the things I'm drawn to, I actually don't know how to do. I feel like I'm not sure how I'm going to do this, where this person lives in me. But I have a curiosity, and, and like an insatiable curiosity about them and how they tick. And so then I go into my excessive research, uh, <laughs> which is uh, it's hours upon hours upon hours. But that's where I find my joy and I can find things that connect me to this character. And I want to, I've been on a, on a roll of playing a lot of um, villainous characters lately, but I always try to find what makes them so human and makes them like me. I think that's also my, that's my ultimate question of like, you know, like, well, how is that person who I think I have nothing in common with? What ties us together? Because it's human, it's the human experience. What do they want that I want as well? And so I think that's part of that, that larger exploration of like, making us all human and like connect and connectivity. And I'm even clearer about that as I'm, I'm 52 years old now. And I think that I've, I have a handle, an idea on what I'm trying to create, how I'm trying to create it, with whom I'm trying to create, what's meaningful to me. What do I think can sort of bridge societies and people and experiences? And it is about, you know, character study. It really is. And really, I want, I want to love every character that I play in some way even if they're doing such harmful, awful things. Like I would say my character in Zola, who was a sex trafficker, and I'm vehemently a, uh, a feminist. <laughs> you know what I mean? And empowering women and making spaces for them. But um, I wanted to find out what makes this guy tick and why does he do what he does? What does he need? You know, why does he need to do that? What is he lacking? That's interesting to me. Well, it's, I, I was actually going to bring that up because I, I, I've seen you say this in a, in a few interviews and you, you just said it just now is, is y you want to find something to, to love about these people. I, I you know, I, again, you, there's these constants with actors and there's, oh, you know, one of the biggest constants is you got to find your way in. You have to find something you relate to. I, I, I don't, I don't know how many times I've heard so specifically, I want to, I want to love these characters. And I think that that's, it, it means the same thing, but I think it's a very interesting way to approach it and to look at it. Yeah. I honestly can say I'm currently playing um, Mista in the mm -hmm. Color Purple uh, musical adaptation film. And I've had to find my way in to love him as well because he's truly oppressing these women. He's a, such a broken human being. Once I figured out he was broken and with that adage that hurt people hurt people, I'm like, who hurt him? Why is he this way? What does he need? So I can find some empathy for him and also I can hopefully let that trickle into him the characterization of him as well. Do I think he should be like a forgiving character? I mean, I feel everyone has some, hopefully some redemptive qualities even. And that's my challenge. The challenge is to take someone who was absolutely a villain in the structure of this piece and make him human and complex. And so you can say, ah, just a moment to say, I see he's so broken. I don't know. So I think something about that's interesting to me. No, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And then, you know, that's, that's the process. And I'm curious, you, you clearly have a process, but you've also, you know, you've, you've been working for, for decades at this point, and I'm sure that's evolved. I'm curious at what point, uh, what has become your quote unquote process? What, when did it start crystallizing? When did you, when did you start sort of picking up like, oh, this, this is something that works. This is something I'll do for the next role. This is something I'll do for the next script. I don't know if I found that to be very honest. I think that I've been working for 32 years. And the way I came into the theater and into film and television was having that spirit of, I don't know, and I will figure it out. I will get as much knowledge as I can to pour into this. I think that every opportunity, you know, I started out in small professional theaters in San Francisco and with little to no experience, but each opportunity was my conservatory. And then I would, you know, go from doing Shakespeare plays to being in the circus to, you know, theater for young audiences, to, you know, you name it, to finally main stages at Berkeley Rap and ACT and all. And then moving to New York and having a, a career there. Each time, I would say, like a musical, like Passing Strange. Did I know how to do that? No. Did I feel like I had skill sets for that? No. When people are like, well, you sing, you dance, you do it. I, yeah, but these are all things I learned for the role. I'm just a very open person. I think malleable in that way. And I'm also a little, I would say, obsessive when it comes to learning something. I've learned to play the trombone in, you know, Marini's Black Bottom. I just learned the banjo for, you know, <laughs> for, for uh, The Color Purple. I will sing in an Elizabethan um, 
sound for playing by Rustin and the rest of Netflix, uh, the movie for Netflix. My process is always changing. I never feel like, oh, this is exactly what I'm going to do to prepare for this. It's case by case, to be very honest. Sometimes I, I can write pages and pages of um, backstory for a character if I feel like I'm missing something. The, the most work, I think, you know, even recently uh, for my character, Ali in Euphoria. Mm-hmm. Euphoria is such a tricky, beautiful series where I know for sure one episode I took myself through of at least at least 120 hours of rehearsal because I felt it was necessary so you do not see the work. I didn't want it to see, I wanted it to be, feel like just a conversation in a very easy conversation of listening and responding. And we do so much work, whether it's Meisner work, you know, to actually get to that place to listen and respond. And so basically I knew I have to be well rehearsed. So I'm not thinking, I don't want the audience to see me thinking. I want the character of Ali in particular. I think already you know, people said, you know, oh, when they meet me, they're like, oh, you don't sound like Ali. I'm like, no, I make choices about where his voice is and his life experience and mm-hmm. knowing he's, he did drugs for so many years and in recovery and uh, he's got a wife and two children that he's estranged from. That all shows up in your voice and your body and your life experience. Even the fact that I have a beard on that show. I do all this creative crafting of it. For my money, the joy for me is when you do not see the work. Hopefully you don't see the work. That's that, that's my goal. I, and I think that's my goal as a director. Like I don't want to see you to see the director's hand. I want you to see the, the, the film or the, the, the play illuminated in every single way, and I sort of back away and let it live and breathe. And that's what I hope to do as an actor, you know? I love, I love the, you don't sound like Ali. And it's like, that's that's because Ali sounds like Ali. You know, that that's... Yeah, because Ali sounds like Ali. It's so funny because people, I guess a lot of times for, you know, I'm really a journeyman. And I think that, you know, I've been doing my work for so many years and, and very people know me from very different things. And for a long time, people couldn't put it together that I'm the same guy because I changed my weight. I, I will pull my hairline back. I will gain some weight. Everything is about each particular character. The way he moves his hands. Does does he move his hands? What's his sign? What does he eat? How does he sleep? I think, um, I don't know, the the, the actors that I admire, like Daniel Day-Lewis or Gary Oldman, or, you know what I mean? I feel like these are are such craftsmen that I, I love and admire, and I love to give myself over to be that person and have that experience. Do you remember the the particular? I mean, of course you do. But what with the particular scene that you just mentioned that you know you 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 really wanted to hone in the, the hundred twenty hours of rehearsal? Do you do you happen to recall which which moment that was? Oh, yeah, that, that was the that was this very special episode of Euphoria. That episode was given to me in the middle of this pandemic when our streets were on fire, and everything about it felt like a sermon. It felt like a sermon to our humanity. The questions of who are we going to become? And it really is just a conversation between myself and Zendaya for 55 minutes. And the moment I read it, first I was sobbing because it was everything I think that I couldn't articulate that I was worried about and cared about. And so I made a point to, I wanted to rehearse that because I think the work needed it. I didn't want to have to think about, oh, what page am I on? Where would that come next? I wanted to live it, you know, and breathe it. So I really did. I pretty much lock myself in my office and I would break it down like I would break down a play. I break down all its actions and, and anything I didn't know or I was curious about it or research or research about Nike practices and how they, you know, where they employ, get their employees from and who makes their sneakers, every little detail. So I, I knew what Ali knew and I could use it in the moment and be honest in the moment. I didn't want it to say, oh, well, now I'm going to feel this way. Now I'm going to experience it this way. No, it was a very open discussion between myself and Zendaya. I think, I don't know what Zendaya, we still don't even talk about what Zendaya did for that scene either. But we were very loose with each other, very open. And Sam Levinson trusts us so much. He, um, we just get, get the cameras rolling and shoot different coverage, but it never felt like the cameras were in the way of the actor. And I say that because there's sometimes, as actors out there know, they're trying to shoot an intimate scene. And there's a camera right here mm-hmm. and, and you're trying to get one eye to see the other actor. It's, it wasn't like that here. She, they, they really put the cameras. I would say Sam Levinson does that as well as like, you know, Barry Jenkins with the Peel Street Talk. Put the cameras on the outside so the actors, they trust that what's happening between us is, is the gold. It's not about their shot, 
you know, they can trust that they'll have a great frame, but they don't want to get in the middle of that alchemy between actors. Well, it's, it's, it's very, I'm very happy you brought that up because, you know, I have a, I have a few just like very specific moments from some of your, your recent television work that I, that I'd, I'd love to ask you about. Cause I think they just sort of sure. encompass who you are as a performer. Uh, and I would love, and I think that a way into your ever evolving process is to just ask you about these specific moments. And I, we can start with that very special episode of Euphoria, uh, filmed during the pandemic. It is just you and Zendaya. It's, it, it feels so much like a play. And the, the moment I sort of, you know, keep coming back to, I'm sure a lot of people could come back to, is uh, the moment in which Rue, Zendaya, tells your character, uh, drugs are probably the reason I haven't killed myself yet. And it's, the reaction is just, you know, about five to six seconds of, of it's it's just you reacting, uh, you know, and, and there's no words, it's just, it's just you taking that in. So I'd, I'd love to sort of, you know, walk me through a moment like that where the moment is just listening and reaction. Uh, just, just sitting there in that moment. I remember that moment in particular because just her response or I mean, me asking her the question or she telling me, I, when she tells me, I don't want to be here anymore. It's a, an amazing thing. What I don't know what I guess certain moments when they're well-written can elicit because it elicited a real honesty um, reaction from me. Like, what do I do with that information? Did Ali know how to respond? Did he? I don't think he knew how to respond to that. And so it's always been important for me in my process to, to not know. Even if I, I know the script, but we've rehearsed it, how can I take myself to a place of not knowing and then letting me be honest? Well, how does he take this in? What does, and then what language do I have? How do I get to that language? If it's first shocking, but my language says something else. But it's about watching behind the eyes, watching that actor figure that out, how to get there. And I knew, I was like, I knew what language I had, but the, re the response was really, uh, I think he, he was, someone, for someone who has a lot to say, he didn't have much to say. All he could do is just sit in that moment and validate her experience. I remember that very well. And so I think that it's just constantly um, to make sure that you don't know you have to remember your character, your, your character does not know this and does not know how to respond, is not equipped. I think that's where there's magic. That's that's perfect because I, I another moment that I would, I'd love to discuss is sort of, you know, the spiritual successor to that moment. And it's it's in actual season two of Euphoria. Uh, I think it's episode three, Made You Look. It's your conversation with Zendaya, which obviously goes through several layers of intensity, but it, it, it sort of peaks at, you know, she, she says, or what Ali you're going to hit me. And then again, oh. it's, and then it's just sort of, um, again, it, it's, it's, it's about 15 full seconds of just reaction, but you're getting, you're getting to a completely different place. I remember in particular, we read the scene, rehearsed it. Sam and I didn't talk a lot about it, but I knew that whatever she was saying was triggering. She was using and weaponizing the confidentiality of what, of what this, other addict had told her in private and so she broke uh, a vow and uh it troubled him because i think in that moment he saw i mean he like he just responded it was just guttural she took him to that place that darkness and i wanted them to see i wanted her to see and it was important to see all that i talked about all that ali has spoken of how dark his life was before, you need to see a glimmer of that. You need to see the animal. You need to see the person who uh, has hit his wife, possibly his children. You need to see that darkness come right out. And then you, and then him trying to assess this situation is like, I can't believe, I think he's in shock that he got back to that place after all the work he has done and that he thought he became something else but it's always there. Like the addict always knows. The addict calls themselves an addict. You know, they're in recovery, but they're an addict. He was like, she made me come outside of myself. And then I think he's disappointed not only in himself, in her, in the situation. And so as a grown man, he's like taking stock of all of it. And he, just, he just walks away. And I'm very happy that Sam left the camera on that whole reaction because it is, it is a tremendous shift and I think you need all of it. And I think for um, 
a less experienced um, director or a very, um, I don't know, I would say a <laughs> particular editor, they would cut all around it mm-hmm. and not see the full moment of experience that a person needs to eventually go and go outside I mean, and leave that person, you know? So, yeah, I remember that very well. In a moment that charge, in a moment that you know, where it requires just pure like you're you're you you are writing that. Uh, what's the what, what is everything around that like? You know, the moment right before action, the moments <laughs> after cut. What is, what is your preferred way of of getting yourself to that little bubble of performance and making all of the other stuff sort of disappear? I think with any well written scene, you take yourself. From the place I don't, I don't do the that preparation of like, oh, I need to feel this in the scene mm-hmm. in some way. That's false to me. What I actually do is, what am I doing right now? He's literally just outside having a smoke, and he's and then he sees this young woman. He's, hey, what's in? You know, it's very simple. What's what's in there? What's going on in, with that bag? And then he's and then I'm letting the scene tell me what it is. So she's walking away. What is that? I'm asking her the question, trying to keep it light. And then she hits me with this. And once that explosion happens, and you know, I don't mean, did we talk about that? Yeah, we talked about it after one rehearsal because I I grabbed the suitcase at first, or then I grabbed her arm at first. And because that is the given circumstances of the scene, and, and we feel very safe with each other. Mm-hmm. We didn't have we didn't talk a lot about it, but we both both say, okay, that's great. You know what it requires. We will never hurt each other, but we make sure that we this practice is always in place to make sure you're safe with each other. And then afterwards, when we after we do something like that, we usually I, I I feel it's very important for me to touch my fellow artists. I would just because I feel like if, especially if something is vitriolic, whatever. I always ask, "Are you okay?" Is like, "You good?" I'm good. You know, you just want to check in. I may lay my hand very simply. It's not like touch touch, because I put my hand on your shoulder, like got you, got you. I feel like it keeps us connected. So that's what I do. I feel like I just um, I know the given circumstances. I know what the possibility of what could happen, but I, I let it happen with the alchemy with my fellow actor. I don't know. I'm not that actor who lays out exactly the way this scene is supposed to look. I, I actually don't know. I feel like I know as much as I know, which is my lines and on my stage. I'm like, oh, a stage like this, this is where we are. I can take in the air. I, I let all that other stuff affect me. Oh, the night air smells good. All that stuff. I feel like I'm just that in the moment actor and I want all of that to help me be honest, you know? So be, with being honest in that way, I don't I don't have a lot of, I don't set up the way a scene is. I used to get so annoyed by actors who I, I could see over in the corner just running the scene. Actually, it seems like they're running the way they want to play it. What kind of fun is that? Is that fun to you? I don't think that's fun at all. I think what's interesting is that I know what I know. 80% of it is I know what I know. I did my homework. And then the other 20% is like, I have no idea what Zendaya is going to do. I have no idea the way Sam wants to stage it. So that I have to just be experience all of that. And then that will make it honest and make it real. For your Emmy consideration for Outstanding Drama Series, HBO's critically acclaimed original series, Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty, is a fast break series about the professional and personal lives of the 1980s Los Angeles Lakers one of sport's most revered and dominant dynasties, a team that defined an era, both on and off the court. All episodes now streaming on HBO Max. Another constant I always hear in these interviews is just how important it is to actually listen to your scene partner. I, I, yes, I, and that, that's, a, that's, that's a very interesting thing because a lot of people do not listen, to mm-hmm. be honest. I could, I, I've stood across many actors and I'm like, you're not listening to me at all. You're just waiting for a cue so you can do what you can do that you think is going to be your performance. You're not concerned about our performance because if you are concerned about our performance, that requires a level of vulnerability and to actually let the experience take you and let it become something that you couldn't even imagine. I think that's the joy of the craft of acting, you know? And, and I sort of like, I, I, I make sure I hold myself accountable for that. I know sometimes where, oh, I've been doing something by rote. Oh, no, 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 go back and need to not know that. My character does not know that information. I need to actually sit with it and figure out what I'm gonna do with the language that I have. You know, it's, it's, it's something even for someone as experienced as I, you have to constantly make sure that you're in that state, you know? I'm curious how much, and especially on a show like Euphoria, like as we've said, it's 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 often very uh, blocked 
like a play. It's often very design format wise, like a play. How much of what you do on camera comes from the theater? How much of everything comes because again, and I keep going back to these constants I hear, but like one of the most constant thing is, is when I ask for advice, it's always go and do theater. Uh, I'm curious uh, how, like, what is the, what is the, the, the core essence of live theater that sort of bleeds into everything else you do? You know what? I'm always, listen, I just had someone I know ask me their advice on a, uh, on a self tape. That was a self tape. And mm -hmm. I watched it and I thought, I thought he could use some theater. Why? Because I didn't think he knew the power of his voice and how to use his voice. I think that he didn't know some technical skills that I learned in the theater. I know how to, the thing that I know about the theater is like, you know, I would do eight shows a week after you've rehearsed it. And I've, I talked about rehearsal so much. I love rehearsal. Rehearsal actually frees me. Some actors in the film and television space think, oh, it'll keep me from being raw in the moment. The more I know, actually, the, the freer I am because I know the map. You know, I think I think I, I, I think I trust that I will have impulse and instinct. And but I also know in film and television, I know how to do it again and again and again, because that comes from the theater. I know how to do this many times and pick up this bottle of water with the same hand on the same line because that's rehearsal. And but yet I can make it organic every time because that's what I had to do eight shows a week. So every time I picked it up, it was a little different in some way. It, you know, you know what I mean? every single time. And it was new and fresh and unique, but I know I had to pick up that water always on the same line. So I can also help technically because act, acting is just not just mm -hmm. acting. You gotta, you gotta help people. Like, you gotta help your editor. They're gonna have to cut your performance in some way. You have to cut angles from wides, the masters, and you know, your name over the shoulders, <laughs> you know, French overs, but you have to help them out. So you gotta know technical skills. You get all that from the theater. That's what I believe. Or you get that from a life of like working on television and film. You start to understand this stuff. But I know when it comes to all the things that I've learned about eye line and camera angles, and size and everything as a director, I learned in the theater. I know how to stage as a director because I'm a theater director. So I'm and for film and television because I know how to stage. I know what works in a thrust and I know what works in a proscenium. <laughs> I know what works in a black box. And I know the rules of engagement, you know, in that way. So I think that I respect the craft so much. I think that all good things start in the theater. And I think it doesn't hurt you at all. If anything, it helps your toolbox. And so I think it's, I, I really think it's, I've learned so much by, by listening, responding to a live audience every single night. I know what jokes work and I know technically how to make them work and get more consistent in some way. I know how to read an audience. And I think that I've learned, since I've learned that in the theater, I think I know how to read, read an audience in television. That seems strange, but it's, I think, I understand what I want the back row in your home to feel in some way. And I know I can do that now with uh, by turning to the side of where my eye goes with my eye line or how I go into a close up in some way or through a quarter, you know? I think I think it all comes from the theater. Well, it's that's really interesting because I I'm curious how that applies to uh, another one of your most High profile TV projects Fear the Walking Dead, which you've been mm -hmm. on, I believe, 98 episodes. Uh seven years across seven years is it? yes <laughs> uh that is a that seems to me you know like a different kind of repetition where you're, you're living with the same character but you're not doing the same thing so I, I'm, I'm curious when you're sitting when you get the opportunity to sit with a character for that long is there something you do to 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 ensure that there's you don't run out of layers to peel back well the interesting thing about being on a long running show is at least from my experience i understand that i and very responsible for and to that character. For his experience and his journey, I know his history and I know uh, his blind spots and also know how he needs to evolve. I know what's true to him. I can always hark back, harken back to someone, oh wow, that's actually just you know, I can work with the showrunners and the writers and say, okay, if you have us making a decision here, just know that part of his history is that he didn't do that. So if we're doing that, just know it's a character turn. You know, because I know the character. And so I could, it's always been very good for me with Fear the Walking Dead because each season, I'm very proud. I can look back at the season and say, it's a very different character each season. He's got a different arc and different needs and different wants. Sometimes I, I even physicalize it. There are times where I feel like my character, Victor Strand, he doesn't want people to see who he is in many ways. So he keeps a beard and longer hair and he was, has a bit more armor on him. 
And then when he's a softer and kinder and learning lessons of love and community, he's been open. I would talk to the showrunners, we would shave my facial hair, uh, have my face very open. I said, because that's where he is psychologically. So that's a great experience for a long running show. And I absolutely was the villain last season. And that was always coming because in some way, because I, I proposed it to my um, showrunners. I said, they were wondering where my character can go after season five. I said, I, I think that he's always had a very ambiguous moral compass. And I think it's time for him to go fully the other way. He's always tried to be a part of the community. I think he needs to have his own community and he needs to run it like a tyrant. And that's what we did. We made him an absolute villain because I thought it was interesting to also see a villain created from the inside. So we have ownership over your character. You can have great conversations on what's important to you, and what's interesting to you how it's also reflecting the world outside in some way. I know that if anyone asked me the detail of why I believe that it was time for Victor to become so sort of this tyrannical, you know, power-hungry guy, I would say, look at some of our, who was leading, you know, some of our spaces and countries of recent years. I said, and also we made, I made choices saying, and you can see, if people really look back and dissect it, I want to make sure that I wasn't touched for like two seasons. I said, what happens when the person's not touched? What happens even like say in this pandemic, I mean, when we're losing touch and like that, what happens to people? What do they become? And so I wanted to experience, you know, have that as part of this experience, you know? And um, yeah, I, I love the ownership I have with Victor Strand and we're going into season eight, which is cool. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that we're coming up on 45 minutes. Uh, I, this, is, this is stuff I could listen to four to five hours, uh, but I, I, I want to respect your time. Uh, so I'm going to ask you just sort of one more overarching question, uh, just based on the whole run you've been on your entire career. When you look back on it, what is what is your core piece of advice for, for, for building an artistic journey that lasts, whatever whatever that means for you? What, is it, what does it mean to build one like an artistic journey with a, a strong foundation? Well, Vinny, first of all, I want to thank you for this um, interview. This is very um, insightful and thoughtful. And you actually, what's beautiful about this is you are reminding me of why I do what I do. And now I am in my, what, 32nd year in this industry. And I'm able to now look back and see that why I've done the things that I've done and what's been important to me. It all goes back to having a respect for this craft and being a craftsman first. It's never been about fame. It's always been about respect. I wanted to be respected like the actors that I knew in the theater. And respect means, you know, I think they had a tremendous work ethic and you're just trying to tell some great stories. So I know that, I think that the art that I've been seeking has also been seeking me because I'm very clear about what I hope to do or hope to be a part of. I don't necessarily do a lot of schlocky stuff, I think. I think I do things that are hopefully a bit meaningful and moves the needle on our humanity. And it's very conscious. That comes from me. I know it does. You know, I get offered many things that I feel like are not in alignment. And I'll say no. You know, for a long time, I, I, I toiled and stayed in the theater because I felt like there was no place for me in film and television. Now, this is years ago before this great glorious days of TV and all my playwriting friends writing for television. This is when I was being offered roles like Cool Whip Tyrell and things like that. Things that I felt like, I thought I'd do something like that. But... And so I stayed in a place where I really felt like I was useful um, because I do believe that what we do is a service job. It is service. And I know that I've been in service. I always tell young people and students when they're asking me to mentor them or what should I do or when, even when I teach, you know, they want to know the answer. And like the answer, I don't know if I can give you the answer. I can give you some places, some tools to be open and figure it out, but your career is gonna be your career. Don't want a career like someone else's. Want your career. That's gonna be even more fulfilling. My career, I don't know how I created my career. I never thought about being on Broadway. I never thought about a television show or being these films that I am or knowing these people. I wanted to work and do good work. And one thing led to another and then to another and to another. And that's, that's the truth of this career. It's a, it's a You've got to be committed for the long run of it. Your success is not going to look like someone else's success. And that's the truth. Your success will, I remember when I got my first, I think I was doing youth theater and had a couple of bartending jobs, you name it. And I had this conversation with my mom, you know, your parents want you to do really well. And she said, oh, I just, I'm not doing that for years. She says, oh, I can't wait for you to be successful. 
And I actually, I remember this conversation. She says, Mom, I think I am successful. I think I'm, I'm doing what you wanted me to do because I'm happy and I'm doing the work that I want to do. And the life of an artist looks like this. It's not all just red carpets and, you know, million dollars, you name it. It's, you know, I think it, it's just being a true artist is having a commitment to creating art and in spaces. And, you know, I think I, I feel very blessed that I'm, I'm still doing it the way I'm doing it because I, I still feel like I'm just starting. I really do because I sort of set myself up like that. I, I will start a production company. Do I know how to run a production company? Absolutely not, but let's figure it the f- out. <laughs> yeah. Let's figure it out and let's make calls and do things that is based on the ethos of our company, not the way someone else has done it. That's their company. You know, do it the way, the way you do it. So I think it's more, I would tell people to continue to find out who they are, to do things that are daring, things that scare you, moving to places where you'll fall in love and you'll learn about art and history and sciences and travel and, I don't know, do things that, I don't know, change you as a person and pour that into your art. And hopefully you'll be sitting where I am 32 years later feeling like you can look back and you can feel very happy and with what you've done and what you've laid out for yourself. Because it really is truly the life of an artist, uh, a multi-hyphenate artist, but I I feel very grateful. And surround yourself with good people, people who really love you, and also people who will challenge you and people who will push you out of your comfort zone. That's what I would tell people. That's beautiful. I don't know if we could, <laughs> I don't know if we, we need to go any much further than that. But I, again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this was, this was incredible. And I, I can't wait to see what's next. Thanks, man. Thanks, as always, to our brilliant producer, Jamie Muffet, and to the whole team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage with code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. 100% free, you simply cannot beat that. For more exclusive content, find us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who should we interview next? Let us know. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another peek in the envelope.